Hello and welcome to Matchbook Meets. Uh, this is the third in the series. The first one I've done, um, as you can see, I'm not Daniel Hussey. Indeed, I'm Ian Fortune. I can't grow the, the beard quite like Daniel. I've always been baby-faced. Another baby face uh, I'm talking to today, an assassin. In, in many ways, is Mark Keaty, one of the uh, shrewdest and most well-respected punters around, certainly in Greyhound Racing, but also a man who, with his wife Hayley, have trained and produced some of the best Greyhounds ever seen in the UK, and indeed in Ireland over the last, well, 10 or 15, maybe 20 years at this stage, Mark. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you. Morning, Ian. How are you? I'm very good. Um, more's the point. How are you? We are yeah. recording this. We are recording this on April Fool's Day, but um, I don't think anyone would regard you as a fool when it comes to sourcing greyhounds, training greyhounds, punting greyhounds. I dare say there's very, very few out there that have the the same level of um, kudos that you've gained over the last twenty years. Ian, we listen. We've been involved in a sport for a number of years. That you don't need me to tell you that we've been very fortunate. There's a there's always no matter how good or how bad you are, and we all had ourselves in the former bracket, and you know, we thought we were good at what we did. But there's always an element amount of luck involved in in still achieving what you set out to achieve. And when you set out on a destination, you always hope that sorry, when you set out on a journey, you always hope that you get to the right destination. And we were lucky that Grand Racing allowed us to do that on a load of occasions, you know. Um, but no, listen, I don't want to. I want to be humble rather than modest. We were. We were able, or should I say, I was able to source the the right dog for Haley to to fuel, and between the two of us, we got it right more often than not, shall we say? Yeah, just looking at you, you're, you're broadcasting there. I'd say from the east wing of the of the palace, is it? Um, you're doing all right for yourself. Um, you've officially retired from training yeah. greyhounds, but if the right greyhound landed on your lap, you may be tempted just to train one, perhaps. Ian, honestly, like it, it, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter out of all the great dogs we've trained if just one of those um, I thought had come our way and the opportunity arose that we were able to, should we say, find a place wherever we may be um, to be able to train him. It's not going to happen, Ian. I'm sorry. No, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm saying I'm sorry. S sorry that I think our time is up. We've we've reached an age, Ian, where I believe that. We've given it everything we've got and we've found it tougher and tougher and tougher over the last couple of years to be able to do what we've been previously able to do. And that's find the lad that we thought nobody else wanted and turn him into the lad that everybody wanted, if you like. And um, I just don't think those type of dogs are there um, as often as they were, shall we say. Ian. And, and even even if they were, I really, really sincerely mean that, you know, mine and, and, and Haley's time of training grounds are up. But what you've got to remember what the sport has also given us, Ian, it's given us opportunity to meet a lot of good people as well that were equally as good as what we were able to do. And, and therefore, because we've made friends of those people, if the right dog did come along, what I will say is I'd dig my hand in my pocket, shall we say, and let them have a go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark, tell us, how did you get involved in the sport first? That dates right back, Ian, to five or six years of age. My um, my grandfather basically was the man that reared me. Um from a young age, I never had a father, but my grandfather took over that role and he was very much involved in a, a business relationship with Charlie Lister. And uh, they were both timber merchants. My grandfather was a man that could be skint on a Monday, but had plenty back in his pocket on a Tuesday and because he was a bad gambler, but a good timber salesman. So, <laughs> so fortunately, I didn't follow in the line of, of the former. Um, I was always able to, to punt a little bit better than my grandfather, God bless him, but he was always able to, to get himself out of trouble a little bit better than me, shall we say, Ian. But no, he introduced me to to Charlie when I was very, very young, dropped me off at the weekends. Um, as he taught me one great thing, Ian, and I'm sure your father taught you the same, see all, hear all, and say Henry all, yeah? And <laughs> that, was, that was what I was taught to do. So I watched everything that, 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 that Charlie did. I listened to everything he told me, and I said very little. I just stored the information up here in hope that the one day I could utilise it and thank God to the great man that I was able to. The great Matthews family, um, they all were, were reared in the same way. They always told me, cash is king and loose yeah. lips sink ships. Simple right. as that. You have, to be, you, have, right. <laughs> you, have, you have to be a very secretive man when it comes to punting yeah. and That's to true. making your way in the punting game. It's something you've managed to do over a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, Let's not let's not fool each other in. When I first started punting, um, and, and it was a, it was only a, it was only a not a mistake. It was more by luck than judgment that I even got to be able to 
become, shall we say, a professional punter. I was very much on the flapping tracks um, down in England, um, ducking and diving with with flapping greyhounds, waiting for the, the right night, night when we got a mark to be able to have the few quid on Ian after we'd been getting um, a, a dog or a bitch ready. And there was some opens on one night in Chesterfield and we had a lovely little dog that we'd been scouring the, 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 the south of England with at the flaps and, and winning opens. We'd actually got him in a graded race. Um, but there were some opens on this particular night at Chesterfield and um, some Scots lads had come down with a real good ground. He was he was actually, they, they kennel named him Lucky. And I call it being lucky that I'd run into these lads this night, to tell you the truth, because they turned out to be two people that introduced me after speaking to them after a night at the dogs with regards to um, a future in betting horses for them. Two very, very shrewd lads, um, um, namely, I'll actually name them because they wouldn't mind. They're, they're not involved themselves anymore. Billy Steele and, and the, sec the second lad was Jimmy Wright that introduced me into Billy Steele. And um, we were very much, uh, shall we say, the word friends from very much that night, night on. Um, they'd heard of me and heard how we were able to do dogs, even on the flaps at such a young age. And because they'd got this ground that they'd more or less run out of tracks with in, the, in, in Scotland, uh, Ian, they asked me outside whether I'd have him down below and swap my dog with theirs so they could go up north with my dog and I could go down south with their dog, you know. And between the two of us, myself and Haley and, and Jimmy and his family up there, we, uh, shall we say, we cleaned up with his dog and he cleaned up with our dog. And from a point of view of when that exercise was over, during that time, I'd been putting a few bets on for them. And I must confirm that I'd not joined any of the bets. But needless to say, every Monday I was due them money. So it didn't take me very long to realise, Ian, that, you know, I ought to start joining those bets. And it was those two lads, more Jimmy, uh, sorry, more Billy than Jimmy, because Jimmy was very much training dogs for Billy and doing it was as told really on gambling, like I'd done as I was told by Billy. And it was him that really educated me into the first and foremost, how to win betting each way on the horses. And very much after that, um, start seeing some first show business out of some tracks I'll 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 not name, but he obviously had an influence in the betting market at those tracks. And we were getting prices that, shall we say, probably shouldn't have been there in. And that's how it got me involved in regards to knowing that, you know, you could win gambling rather than being a rec recreational punter. And what sort of, what sort of era was this then? Like when are we talking about Mark? I was I was 18 years of age. That's 30 that's 34 years ago in. Okay, wow. 34 years ago. And I have to say, from meeting Billy Steele to then being introduced to a gentleman called Duncan Lambie, I was literally, this is, this, this is, I, I can't explain it any better than this part of the a gambling mafia, mate. These, these lads just didn't leave it behind. They were just absolute, you call, you, you, you used a word earlier on, assassin, Ian. When these lads got involved in 16, 18 and 20 and big runner handicaps, and there was, there was going biases at straight courses like Newcastle and turning tracks like Catrick, they were just absolutely on the money. You know, they knew when the horses needed to come this side and therefore taking advantage of prices that were wrong in the betting market. Um, um, and one thing led to another, Ian, and before I knew where I were, I was just educating myself on how to gamble, not on a horse or a dog, just educating myself how to gamble. And again, using those and those and not using that and... Everything panned out from a very short space of time into into saying to myself, well, look, you know, I think my forte is greyhounds. And as much as I'm making real good money by being introduced into these people, can I not do the same on a bit of software for the greyhounds? And and that's that's where it all started in from being 21, 22. I just basically got stuck into greyhound videos and thought from a very early stage that I was quite good at it. And the best you, you were, you were, you were one of the very few, the very first, shall I say, that really embraced the video technology, taking splits, taking clocks, uh, and leaving nothing to chance per se. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I, I'm still, I, I've still got a part in me that that also is is old school, um, Ian, with regards to you know, if 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 I was turning up at venues because at that stage, because the betting markets were so strong and there were no exchange facilities, I was actually turning up at betting tracks, uh, sorry, at tracks, um, Ian, and betting in the market because the market was so strong. We had bookmakers in those days, Ian. I, re I remember quite clearly regular having um, what I'd perceived to be very, very large bets on a ground that I thought was priced uh, correctly for me to, to be staking it at and turning me back and going in the stand at, at places like White City and places like that and turning, turning around, it's a bigger price, Ian. 
you know, like I've had my few quid on from I perceive to be a good judge. And I could walk back in the stands. And by the time I've got back in, it could be a bigger price. The market was so strong. And as I say, I was just a young boy. I was a very, very much an apprentice at what I was doing. And there were people in the betting ring that were, well, they were, they were, they were, just, they were just brilliant judges. Just brilliant. Ian, if I started to tell you how many good people there are today compared to how many good people there were then, the numbers are so different. It's night and day. Today, there's only a small nucleus, I believe. Of you could name you could name them and, and place them on sort of two, maybe three hands. Uh, whereas back then, you Absolutely. could Absolutely. you could have a bucket full of them. That's right. But even though there were so many winning punters in those days, Ian, there was so much more many many punters around them as well that allowed the the the, the lads on the pitches to still take the likes of myself and all the other ruthless individuals on because. The market was so vast, whereas now, um, you know, there's much, much fewer, shall I say, I, I believe to be quality professional gamblers that you'd think that the marketplace was, was was they were excelling, but they can't because there's not the, shall we say, the mug money around for argument's sake to allow individuals to take those professional individuals on in. It's just not there. It's just, the, you know, even the exchange markets now in the, the, there's not enough money. There's not enough layers. We need layers. We need layers. For me to continue to be good, you need somebody to want to lay you in, don't you? Yeah. You. To be honest, we need a, a Romford Friday Absolutely. night on every card, not, not just Romford on a Friday night where Absolutely. you can see that 60, 70, whatever thousand match yeah, before, yeah. before the race starts. Yeah, Tell me this, Mark, before we, get back, before we go back into the punting, and I really yeah. do want to focus on the punting because I suppose that's the part of you that, what people know of, but don't really know of. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. Whereas yeah. they know about your 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 yeah. success as, as trainer and owner and, and a man that sources greyhounds. Let's talk about the dogs for a moment. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I was going through with the dogs that you've you've handled and that that Haley has handled through the years, um, it doesn't matter. Stair, sprinter, middle distance. I, I know you put all the success down to Haley and the care and attention she gives towards those dogs. It doesn't seem to matter what shape or form they come in. You seem to get the best out of them. The thing is, Ian. The thing is, see, I don't think, I don't think trade. As I said to you, I was brought up watching a man that I perceived to be was just brilliant at understanding dog A and dog B. There was no repetition in training a greyhound with Charlie Lister. He looked at a greyhound and he looked at another one completely different. They were two different individuals. So therefore. Unless they were twins, they were different. And that's how he trained greyhounds. He, he, he had numbers that he could handle and the amounts of dogs that he could put his whole emphasis on making sure that he went through the alphabet, A to Z. And that's that's the big thing, I think, that was that was a big positive for myself and Haley to be so good. And particularly Haley, because there's no doubt that everybody out there, Ian, said Mark Keatley trains those dogs, yeah? And Mark Keatley... Well, I'm glad you asked. No, dogs, dogs. I I couldn't care less what anyone says. If you have a kennel, you don't have a female in there. You're doing it wrong Listen, because good, dogs good react much better to females. Good man. And let me tell you, that was the key to Charlie Lister as well. Charlie Lister's first wife, Val, was a big influence in in Charlie's training of greyhounds. They were they were they were just unicism. They were just like they were just shadows of one another. And that's how me and Haley was when I first met Haley. From the day I met her in a pub. That I'd never set eyes on her before in my life, and she was sat with a friend of mine that I didn't know she was going out with. From that day forward, that we went out that night, there weren't too many days after that that we weren't together. So there was an element of of trust from day one, and an element of trust for being companions into into training grounds was 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 very much easy. It was so easy. We, we'd never got fed up with one another, and that's not easy done, is it? You know, when you live with somebody, you know, it's not, let's get it right. You know, My wife gets sick of me every day. Well, there you go, you know, and listen, we've had ups and downs like anybody else, but, you know, when, when it came to training greyhounds um, and it came to looking after greyhounds, you, the question you asked was, what was the key to it? And I think it's very, very simple. I don't think, I have this conversation with loads of people, I don't think it's difficult, Ian. If you've got a greyhound that, that knows that you care for it and if it's cold outside you're keeping it warm and if it's too hot outside you're keeping it cool and if you give it something in its bowl that it thinks well you know i've had a taste of that and it, and it tastes really nice and it's nutritious and it's the correct diet and he's not got a, a tfl that's a bit sore because you didn't attend to it after he'd run four days earlier and 
in general, his mouth's feeling a bit clean because he's had his teeth cleaned every day. And if you know as well as I do, and you don't go in the bathroom, clean your teeth three or four days, I don't care who it is, you're not feeling great. If you've not had a wash, you're not feeling great. And if you've had a night, you know, the, the night before, if you've had a vigorous race and you've put him through the ringer and the next morning he's feeling tired, he's no different to you having 12 pints of lager when you really knew you should have only had six. You need to do something about it. She was brilliant at keeping dogs hydrated. She was fantastic at making sure that when our dogs turned up, they weren't injured, but they were healthy. And more importantly, Ian, more importantly, like I treated Haley as my best friend, those dogs knew that they were her best friend. And there you were can't, times you can't, you can't train a dog to run fast. You just have to get them, put them in a position where they're right. feeling feeling that they can run as fast. Correct. Right. And more importantly, Ian, if they've got something in there and they want to do it, yeah. You know as well as I do, times many, and even though they might be rogues, you know, there's, there's dogs out there, Ian, that either do or don't want to do it. And it don't make them any worse of an animal if they don't want to do it. You just, you know, you just have to accept the fact that, you know, you're not going to encourage him to do something he doesn't want to do. So we were lucky as well, Ian, that when we got greyhounds, and without sounding too big headed, when they turned up to what we thought was the Ritz, because that's we every money, every bit of money in that I ever won gambling, believe it or believe it not, didn't go on a flash car or I mean we had nice cars in and we've always had nice houses. But honestly, anybody ever came to my kennels, I'm proud to say that whether it was Julie Collier from Sky or whether it was anybody that came from another kennel or any uh, TV pundit or anybody that turned up a, a, an owner of another person's kennel, they walked in and I didn't didn't have to say wow Ian, I just saw it in their face. But that wasn't me being big headed. That was me doing something that when you walk into somewhere, Ian, or the greyhound lives in that environment, nobody's going to convince me any different because training greyhounds as well, Ian, was a lot about my head. Haley knew that it was easy for her to train a greyhound and have a, have a day with the dogs and still maintain, um, should we say, fluency in the kennel if my head was good. I hated my head being wrong, Ian. Say we'd had a night where it had not gone good the night before and I never blame the dog in it, I always blame myself. Because I either entered him wrong, seeded him wrong. I'd asked Ailey to maybe do something different that she wouldn't have normally done, sticking my nose in, shall we say. And I always blame myself. And if I went a little bit negative, she hated that. Because she felt it, it, it passed on to her and it passed on to the dog. So a lot of times people did walk on eggshells with me to make sure that they kept, if my head was good, everything went fine. And if my head was a little bit sloppy because I got a silver rather than a gold the night before, it was a little bit like what we've got to do to make him right. And so she weren't only training the dogs in, she was training me, which nobody ever gets to see. You know, yeah. honestly, it's true, Ian. It, it, sounds a bit, it sounds a bit childish and a bit, shall we say, um, a bit left wing, but it's true. Honestly, I, I'm, a, I'm a funny individual, Ian, in the respect of when, when I'm punting, um, when we were training dogs, even when we were driving the van. You know, she hated the fact that if we got beat, I would go in the van and be quiet. She, she thought that was wrong. You know, like the, the song Silence is Golden was a joke between the two of us. You know, and there was there was often a, um, she'd look across to me and say, Mark, we're not in this for you to be sad. We're not in, we're in this together to enjoy it. And if we got beat, Haley went in the van, she got cracking home. And then the next day was Tuesday, not Monday. And we start again, whereas... I held grudges with myself, Ian, you know. But even though I didn't think that was good for the training, it was brilliant for the punting, Ian. Because, you know, when I bet a loser, just moving away from the dog side of me, you know, if I bet a loser, I want to analyse why I got it wrong. Because I don't expect to get it wrong, Ian, yeah? And where it stood me in, I think, bad stead training them, it stood me in good stead for punting them. So I used the, I took the positives out, the negatives, if you like, to to make sure I was I was I was sorting it out mentally in the kennel for Haley, and yet utilizing the negativity I'd held, shall we say, that wasn't good for training them, was good for punting them. And I really, really, really do believe that the understanding of the relationship we had was a massive, massive plus into how we were successful for so long because. The understanding element of what I need I needed to be to be one hundred percent was all brought to me by by Haley. Honestly, I can't even start to explain to you what an influence she was in everything we did, whether it was training or punting. Even even to a degree whereby that 
Hayley knows nothing about gambling. She'd be the first to tell you she wouldn't know if something should be six to four or six to one. But she knows I do. And yeah. if I get it wrong, like a cup of tea will come on the desk and I just know by looking at her, she'll say, move on. I don't have to look at her to say, I've heard you like talking to you. I talk to myself here. I answer myself back. From a punting point of view, that's a great thing to have. Yeah, Someone absolutely. That supports you and, and that understands that yeah. you need to do this and go through your process. Ian, I've seen a load of marriages break down because of gambling. Not because they've won or lost, because of the selfishness of a professional gambler. We're always frightened of missing the winner, aren't we? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, it's the worst, you know, it's the worst thing in the world. It's one thing about backing a loser, but but missing a winner is far right. worse. You know, I said every night to Shelburne Park, making my announcements, don't miss out on the winner, folks, because it's far worse than backing a loser. Absolutely. You know, I, I had a huge problem, Ian, that I don't mean a problem gambling. I mean... In my AD, and I've got loads of men working in the shops for me. Yeah? I'm sorry to, I, I do. Can, can, I, can I just say one thing? I do want to go back onto the greyhounds. I really do. Absolutely, absolutely. But anybody that knows me, I am sporadic, and I do move from conversation to conversation. For that, I do apologise. But what I want to get across to you is that, from a punting point of view, I'm a very, very well moraled individual. I think I am in. For all that people do think of me, and listen, there's loads of people in of to Cumbridge of the way I am, because I am a person that please or offend, I will give you my honest opinion. Even if I, even if it turns out to be wrong, I'm telling you what I think. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what I, what, what, what I think is right, Ian. So I have offended a lot of people during my time of being involved in both training and punting greyhounds. But the one thing that everybody will give me, should we say, a, a tick for is that if you're working with me, Ian, whether it be in a shop, uh, online, or in Betfair, you're getting everything from me. You're not getting half of it or most of it. You're getting it all. And if I, if in my heyday, I'd have in the region of twenty to twenty-five people in the shops working for me every day. Ian, on the show, when there was when 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 the first show was still available, I'd done a lot of work for twelve months working out the tracks where I thought will say there was prices that they shouldn't have been. We'll use that word, shall we? You know, where I think that there was a bit of chalk going on a board, whereby from time to time in races, if I sat there and done the work at the, those tracks we're talking about, I would see a price come on a board that I could text my boys in the shop and say, whatever I want on it, at the price, don't think it should be that price. And for, for whatever reason, be it just laziness or, as you say yourself, yes, for, absolutely. For, for, for different reasons. Correct. So when you have those type of people that have left a building site painting or they've come out of a factory or they've just seen you punting at Nottingham and they've come across and said, hello, mate, see you back a few minutes. Can't give me a tip, can you? And so you get chatting to them. You say, well, what do you do? Well, to be honest, I'm, I'm, at this moment time, I've lost my job. They came into the team straight away. You know, anybody that was looking to place bets that I thought that have educated properly on how to conduct themselves in a bookmaker's, and not be on a phone and, and so on and so forth and, and jumping up and down when they win. If I thought I could educate somebody to be professional and and trust them, most important person, most sorry, most important thing about this in you can bet as many winners as you like, but you must get paid. You know, if you don't get paid, then you know, then then the winners don't mean anything. It's a so, pointless exercise then, isn't it? Absolutely. So the numbers that were working for me, Ian, you know, even though they weren't employed. I, 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 they were part of me then, Ian. I just couldn't say bugger off for two or three days because I've brought them away from jobs, Ian. You know, I've taken them away from an income or most of them to say, look, come and work for me in a betting shop. This is the type of I'm going to give you to give you room to manoeuvre to be able to join them yourself. Now, I know you're going to have to see some, some, some winners. You're going to have to see some positivity out of what I do before you probably want to invest your own money. And based on that, I'll pay your expenses for the day. Um, albeit that you're not employed, I'll give you a few quid as a gesture of thank you for standing in a betting shop for putting bets on for me. Because there would be days in where I wouldn't have a bet. You know, there'd be days where I might look at track A and track B and I'd say in in in, in, in a punting te terminology, there was no ricks, so I didn't have a bet. And that was the hard bit they found difficult to overcome. This is man like taking the taking the mickey out of me. I've stood here like for six hours today. He's not had a bet. But they quickly learned, Ian, that that was part of my DNA. You know, my DNA is that I just didn't have a bet for having a bet's sake. And these people quickly grew into my mentality of thinking, well, there's not a bet to be had. We've stood here. We've not wasted our time because what he's not done is he's not also allowed us to have a bet for a bet's sake. And 
just to keep us happy and we've donated 200 to the charity and the charity being Paddy Power or Ladbrokes or Willie Mills or Corals or wherever the shops were in on that particular day. So I hated the fact, Ian, that if I'd done a card and let's say for argument's sake we were going racing, which I didn't like to do if, if, I'd, if I'd done my day's work to be able to sit there in my office and not concentrate wholeheartedly for the whole of the meeting, I felt I was letting those people down that I always used to bring along my third friend and they used to call it, we brought the relative with us, the laptop in, yeah? Couldn't yeah. go anywhere without the laptop book. And she stood by me through, we were supposed to be going racing together in, in a, say, a semi-final or a final, or even just a one-off race, but the laptop had to come with me. And like, You still have to pay the bills, effectively. Correct, correct. But, you know, Ian, very quickly, very quickly from, from being involved in punting, I did get myself into a decent position, shall we say, very quickly. So it's very difficult sometimes, and I'm not being criticism here towards the other race, for a female to understand how we work. It is it is hard. And as I've said earlier on in the conversation, I'm lucky I've got that female that understands me from the start to the end of the alphabet. But there was even times where I know that laptop frustrated her because... Did was, I there really times you thought she, was there times you thought she was going to throw it out the window on the way? Oh, mate, listen, honestly, I've done it in restaurants, Ian. I've pulled it out. I've, I've got this this year, this year, Ian, I've pulled out a restaurant's regular at 8.12. Well, I was betting the 8.27 ale, you know? And, like, I've retired from that as well, Ian. So I've not only re retired from ground. I've, I've, I actually now discipline myself to say, it's not the end of the world if I don't get 300 quid on a seven or four shot that should be four to six. Do you understand me? And it's not the yeah. end of the world. But, but that's not to say that needs must and times must. I don't, I don't say I make an habit of saying, well, I'll go for a glass of champagne and a meal in front of having a bet. Because as you've rightly said, even though we've stopped training greyhounds and even though we've retired from that element of the sport, I'm very much down the down the elm in that i actually don't want to pay for my standards of life still either i want somebody else to so it does hurt me to think that if there is an opportunity there i'll let it go because that's the ruthless side of mark keithley i just feel as though i need a victim and that victim don't need to be me to be able to swipe the card at the bill at the end of the night and just have it on my conscience that i've paid for it rather than somebody else <laughs> It's uh, money, money, uh, money. One is is twice as sweet as money. Right? Yeah. Isn't that what they say? yeah. So I do know myself that during that conversation, I have, I have moved away from certain elements of the question you've asked me, and I am guilty of that. And I do respect anybody that maybe does want an interview or has taken an interview on me before, does have to have a certain open mind as to what part of the conversation is he talking about now. So I do apologise if I've gone round the mountains there to to get to the eventual points I wanted to get across. Um, so, Ian, I'm sorry about that. If I've if I've moved away in diversity fraud from your original question, Mark, Mark, we want to hear about you. You know what I mean? It's not about my questions. Tell me this: Do you still regard yourself as a full time punter, or are you now a just a, a punter? Like, would you still regard yourself as a professional punter, or is it just a case of I'm, I'm now retired, but I still punt? No, no. There's not a day, Ian, that I don't go in the office. Not one day. Now, if I know, like this afternoon, for argument's sake, we're going to nip out for a bit of lunch together. I was, and I've got an interview with yourself. I was up double early getting my work done for tonight, yeah? Um, I, I finished it yesterday, but I just wanted to gl glance over it as well this morning because we were away seeing my, my, my kids yesterday up north. So, no, Ian, honestly, there's not a day goes by where I still don't give myself an opportunity. But I'm even more disciplined now, Ian, because I know that when we retired from Greyhounds, we said we were retiring to see something else. So it would be very, very selfish of me to say to Hayley, there's no more leads, but there's still some buttons to be pressed. So I am much better now, Ian, at showing a little bit more respect and less selfishness for the office um, than I ever was. But I have to be honest, there's not a day goes by that even though I'm doing much, much less work, that I don't even work even harder at the tracks that I am working at, if that makes sense. I'm, not, I'm not doing endless tracks anymore. I concentrate and put my emphasis on three particular tracks. And that, was, that was going to be my next question. You are specialising. It's yes. it's it's graded and open, but it's three main tracks. To be honest, Ian, I've, the open. Uh, this sounds. Listen, I've been to Shelburne Park the last two Saturdays, and open racing will always be a part of me because that's where I got my greatest success 
have been involved in trading grounds with Ava. Um, but the fact is, I actually respect anybody that makes a living out of betting open race dogs. I do. And I know individuals that do. Um, and I like those people as well. The, the way they go about it is fantastic. Um, I've not gone down that route, Ian. I have to be honest to tell you that I'm getting a living out of open race grounds. I actually don't know who's training what on the open race scene anymore. That sounds bad, doesn't it? I don't, honestly. Well, it does. But to a point, like, Mark, I, I often speak to the younger lads that, and they really are enthusiastic, the young punters still. To this day, you see a young punter coming into the game and they just want to go gung-ho. But it's yeah. always focused towards Saturday night. Certainly my end, Saturday yeah, yeah. night in Sheldon Park. And I go to them, yeah. that's all really good. They say, what do you fancy tonight? I said, I didn't even look at it. I said, it's an yeah, open yeah. race card. I do my previews. I, I talk yeah, about yeah. it. But when it comes down to it, the, yeah, yeah. the 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 possibilities of making money are far greater during the week when it's Absolutely. less quality of greyhound Correct. and there's a greater disparity between the fastest and the slowest in the race. Correct. And you know, and you know, Ian, what you've just said there, you've actually hit the, the you've just hit the nail on on the head. Is the fact that I want to be pe people people look at me like I'm an alien when when I say I get my money out of low grade greyhounds, a tens, a nines, a eights. You know. Um, I'm not interested in, in, in A1s and A2s and D1s and D2s. I'm just not interested in them. Listen, I do the race. I do the card. But I can tell you 80 or 90% of the time at one particular track that I get good money at from low-grade racing that the manager is able to do a lot better job in those races than he is in the, in the lower-grade races, yeah? Yeah. Uh, that's common sense, isn't it? It's not. It's not. It's it not. But you, you're, you're also in a situation where a D1 sprinter probably has 100 races, and Absolutely. you know something in an A9, A10. There's always something there. Uh, right. Like as we're talking now, like a May 20 that's had Absolutely. three races and it's been beaten fifth, fifth, and fourth. But you've seen enough to suggest it's going to be an Absolutely. accident to happen. Absolutely. There's a lot more grounds in those that are showing un, you know, that are showing disguised form than there is in the higher higher end, and. I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say, Ian, I'm, I'm not, but I couldn't tell you what Mark Wallace, Patrick Janssen's, um, all the other top trainers in England are training right now. I couldn't give you a Patrick Janssen's ground or, or a Mark Wallace ground. See, two years ago, I could you could say to me, what about uh, Bocco's belly or what about um, Thornfield Falcon or what about, um, I don't know, one of the Ianza Royale. I could, I, could, I could sit here and talk to you about that one ground for an hour and tell you what I think it's good points are, it's bad points, where it should be drawn. Thought Mark was wrong entering it at such a track with a middle seed. I think it wants wide at this track. I don't know a ground they train at the moment. And I've been to Shelburne Park the last two Saturdays. And if it wasn't for the fact that I was stood with Austin Ely and I knew he owns um, Beach Avenue, I wouldn't have known a runner on the card, uh, Ian. I really would not have known a runner. I honestly, honestly, I've just lost so much um, knowledge of the open race scene since myself and Ailey, um, you know, stopped training the grounds because we're just not a part of it anymore. And 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 you're, you're like you're you're like a football punter that bets Division Two, Division Three, you know, conference. But every now and again, could sit down and watch a Premier League match Absolutely. without knowing who's actually playing, or or, or you know, just have an interest in it without Absolutely. having a, a vested interest. Absolutely, I will say this. <laughs> Off, uh, uh, just just if you like a little bit. Um, contradictive there was a ground that did run Saturday night at, at, at Sheldon Park and it did look like it had found its feet again a, a, a ground that Graham Holland trained you might be able to tell me one out of trap three Park Lake if that's not your number one for the English derby I'll stand locking up He's been, he's been there for a while. He's been there for a while, Mark. He's been there for a while. Oh, yeah. Saw, I, what was that? I looked down at the card and I thought to myself, look like that lad got resurrected tonight, you know? My yeah, there's a, few more, there's a few more lengths to find. Uh, oh, right. see, people could be watching this in six months' time going, those two Egypts, you know what I mean? That, All right, he, yeah. he, never, he, never, he wasn't listen, mapped to Toaster. I don't even know if he's going to Toaster or not, but my God, I, I did like him. I did like yeah, him. I like, I like him too. Uh, Mark, um, the punting... Uh, the work that you put involved, the work that you go into, is still very much video based. I assume still clock based, um, and you are focusing on, on on three tracks. You know, you say you go to the office every day. What sort of hours do you reckon you're doing a week? Um, I get out every day with Ailey. Every single day we do something together. Um, that never happened. Um, I do work round. I do work round the time that we spend together every day, going somewhere. But even now, you know, I would guess that I'm spending fifty to sixty hours a week still in the office. 
Yeah, and it doesn't feel like, but it doesn't feel like work as such. You're studying no. greyhounds. You're you're but punting Ian, away. If I said to you that nobody but nobody when it comes to punting, see the thing is, Ian, the thing is, when you think your favourite to do something you enjoy doing, favourite to win, shall we say, and something you enjoy doing, and the money aspect of it is important. Don't get me wrong, but. What I can get out of it now is probably nothing like what I've had out of the game previously. But I still think I've got the biggest needle there is for the, the must to have it every single day. And if that makes sense, I need to inject the enjoyment I get out of what I do still every day inside me. And I need to. It's just something I kept the, the promises. I, Ian, I can't even start to tell you the promises I said to Ailey about the less time I would spend in the office once she's retired to ensure that we do everything we want to do outside of ground racing. Yeah, but that said, now, if you were spending every hour of every day with Hayley, she'd soon get sicky, I'm sure. Oh, she would. She would. But do you know what I've done to compensate it, Ian? Is that I probably haven't cut down the amount of time I'm spending in the office by a lot. I'm just spending more time with Hayley. Does that make sense? No, it does, of course. Yeah, yeah. I start earlier and finish later to ensure that I give Hayley the time she deserves uh, and the respect she deserves for to, for really putting up with me for the time she's put up me in doing what I've been doing. Now, there's nobody more than Ailey holds her hands up and said, what we've been able to do with you having the ability to do what you've been able to do, and that's win professional gambling with greyhounds now and horses initially, is allowed us to be what we are outside the sport of training greyhounds. Um, admittedly, when we had a business for a short space of time, um, in the early stages of our marriage, Ailey was absolutely a fantastic company secretary in 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 ensuring that the the focus on the the, the window business we had also got us a big step up the ladder uh, for me to be able to still concentrate even more on doing what I was doing, and that was punting in the end office rather than ensuring the deliveries got delivered to wherever they got needed to get delivered that day because I knew Ailey was doing it. So even again. Though people think it's me, it's a team. I, honestly, but you can't. Honestly, I cannot get across to you and emphasise enough just how the two of us have gelled together in every single thing we've done. And I can't also reiterate to you, Ian, enough that not a lot of people have been that lucky to keep their marriages, never mind be successful doing what we've been doing because of the selfishness as the professional gambler. Ian, I know I've got friends today. I, I, I look. I speak. To, I speak to. A, I speak to. A lot of people during the day, they get money differently to the way I do. Horses, uh, uh, Asian handicap football, all sorts of bits and pieces that they kindly come and give to me. And I sometimes will go to them, to a particular, a particular individual I have massive time for. He, he likes to pump something at, should we say, 10 to 11 or 4 to 5 in that I might make 1 to 4. That's his type of DNA. It's not my, you might think, well, why is that any different, Mark, to something you bet at six that you should you should you, you make five to two? I've always been down the elk, Ian, of like if I can have 160 on to win a grand at six to one and I make it five to two, I don't want to have eleven hundred to win ten, even even if I make it one to four. Does that make sense? No, it just makes it's sense. Just, yeah. It's just my DNA. It's just my DNA. So, so, some people are built that way. You know, there's no, no question right. about it. And listen, we we both know the virtues of value. You know, again, four on about eleven to ten chance is the best value you're ever going to get out there. But Absolutely. you'd sooner six to one about a five to two chance. Yeah, and, and and people will say, well, look, you know, the eleven to ten shots got a much better chance. Sorry, the the eleven to ten shot, the eleven to ten on shot marks got a the market tells you it's got a much better chance than the the, the dog you make five to two at six, but. In reality, in the back of my head, I'm probably shorter than five to two in, but I keep that to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, so it's they're never ever going to extract me to be able to change. Like, honestly, people people would get infuriated with me, they get frustrated with me. But all I do is I just pull my diary out and I, sh and I say, Look, you know, you can't tell me to do anything differently to what I'm doing because I'm not going to fix something that's not broken. I see a lot of black pen in my book and no red pen. If it's I was going to ask. I was going to ask you. It's been a discussion recently on social media in in, in punting in punting spaces, shall we say? Are, are you a strict records keeper? Do you keep strict records, or is I know it just a, a figure at the end of the day? I know I win daily, daily, weekly, and monthly. Or, but you're not week. you're you're not you're not talking about every bet. You're, you're just writing a daily a record. Daily figure, a daily yeah. figure, a weekly figure, a monthly figure. 
And I also I also know exactly how I fare at every track as well. And the type of bets, whether it be single, cheap. Ian, I'm not afraid to tell you that my my biggest income every single year is multiples. Mm-hmm. I'm not a massive winner on Betfair because I don't try to be. Or a matchbook. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, what? I did, did say to you, didn't I? I did say to you, didn't I, that I would make a mistake. And because I, That's I, I, okay. But that's okay. <laughs> sorry. I do apologize, Ian. I do apologize. I'm not a big winner on the exchange because I don't try to be. But I am a good winner um, from, a, from a multiple point of view because I feel I'm, I'm able to put together the right greyhounds at the right prices to make me good at being a winner with multiples. I don't put, for the sake of it, three short price favourites in at seven to four because I make them all evens. I, I just, you know, I, I don't do that. I'm not saying I haven't done it. I'm just saying it's not something that, that I look to do. But I do look, because you cannot catch the firms anymore, Ian, with a single, a single bet. You know, they don't lay you big enough anymore a six to one shot to warrant the being a single i'll never let i'll never let the bookmakers close me down for having 80 quid on someone at six to one Ian. they're not getting that opportunity if they're going to close me down they're going to have a liability on their books of 15 or 20 grand Do you understand me Ian? Course, and i don't course. mind them closing me down then if they close me down with one bet then i'm happy because they've given me opportunity to beat them for 20 grand but i am not close they're not closing my account i'm not giving the lady at 365 or the guy at skybet or any other bookmaker for that matter the chance to close Mark Keithley down for 500 quid, 80 quid, it's not happening. I have to ask you, this This sort of brings me along to a, to a nice little question. Um, punting do's and don'ts. Is there a couple of do's, a couple of don'ts that you'd stick by or recommend young punters? There's absolutely no doubt if you're looking to make money in from betting anything, the one thing that everybody will tell you is that is discipline is absolutely key to being successful. And what I mean by discipline is, that if if you firmly believe that that you're able to price a race correctly and you believe that by doing that those pricings to whether you want to do it for 100% which the exchanges do or at 125 or 137 whatever you want to do price it a bookmaker's percentage i believe that if you're able to to to, to master the art of getting the price right and being disciplined by that, that is key in all aspects. Let's get it right. I mean, um, we'll use Ted for argument's sake at Shelburne Park. I have to use him, yeah? Um, for a long, long time, or anybody at Shelburne Park, they were able to get away with pricing to such a big percentage, shall we say, that in my opinion, they couldn't get it wrong. And unfortunately for them, they didn't have disciplined, disciplined punters in the betting ring, or there were a few of them. I would imagine that there were going to be a handful that Ted was ever frightened of, not for the amount of money they were coming to the joint with, for their opinion. And that's because he had, so, in my opinion, he had so much representation in his margin. Now, having said that, people often say to me, how oh, can you win punching at 150? My answer to that was, I'm not looking to bet six dogs in the race. I'm looking for him to make one mistake. And if he goes, I don't care if he prices to 150, if he goes two to one something, I'll make four to five. That's the biggest mistake that I'm interested in, not the other five. It's it's an it's an argument I make all the time. People right. say, "Oh, they, well, they bet to two hundred percent." Yeah, but there was a six to four chance there should have been three on. Good man. So so what I'm saying is, for the normal punter, that percentage is fine because in the heyday, Ted probably would have laid four or five dogs in the race, not to money, but four or five dogs when there was a huge crowd in Sheldon Park. When it came down to the, should we say the core handful of punters, the Larry Dundays, for argument's sake, when people would be doing the job properly. He had, he had to price he had to price the man rather than the dog sometimes because he'd have to second guess, shall we say, what Larry might bet, what the Matthews might bet. So he'd price a card, in my opinion, and think there's no way they're coming in to bet the five dog, the five yoke here. I'll go eight that instead of four, and I'll go six to four the one because I think that's the joint. I should be going to it, but I'll go six to four it. It's why that's, the off course prices over the years have been very different to Ted's prices on the night. Right, that's what I'm getting at, Ian. Yes, so. Whereas with Ted, you could go and have your 20,000 to 10 for argument's sake when the market was fantastic. You haven't got that facility at four to one or six to one with the ricks that the individuals make online in. So what I would say to people is that are starting out and think they're good or think they can become good. Do not fall for the three card trick of being disciplined in getting your prices right and letting the bookmaker off with a single bet to win a monkey. 
It's not, Ian, it just because as sure as night follows day, Ian, as sure as night follows day, when that starts five to two, that account's gone. And you've had a chance to win nothing. You've had a chance to win a Friday night out in Dublin. That's all you've had a chance to win. <laughs> or a Saturday not, night not, a, not even a good Friday night. No. Do you understand? <laughs> So, of course, so of course. If, if, you, if, you, if you're going to if you're going to give away your account, give correct. it away for the right money. Correct, and for the right reasons. And what I would say is, there's 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 very much a situation that I believe today, because of that happening of of the the, the lack of liquidity, shall we say, and the lack of longevity in accounts. I think we're finding more, shall we say, of the of the better judges are doing too much work as well, and they're trying to do too many tracks to try and find an angle, try and find a move. Don't try and make something happen, Ian. If it's going to happen, it'll happen. Yeah? Specialize. Absolutely. You know, this, Ian, why do you need to do three tracks or four tracks or five tracks? I'm doing three tracks because I'm emphasizing I'm not doing the whole card. I'm doing sprints at a track. I'm doing a whole card, and I'm doing stain races at a track because I've found that I think the grader's weak on his stain races at a specific track. I think there's one track where I think the racing manager is weak start to finish. I know it's not very nice, but he is. And I think the other track has got far too many four bend dogs running in sprints. And I'm utilizing the fact that I think I can find the sprinter against the four bender. Do you understand me? Of course. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm not doing five sets of 12 races, um, a meeting. I'm, I'm picking out what I believe to be are good and bad for Mark Keithley. And what I would say to people that might want to start out right now, I'm glad I haven't got to, by the way, but I, I, what I would say is I would say, don't try and do too much. And don't try and win too little. Do not think for one minute, Ian, that the right move, in, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you see, as I say, I'll repeat myself, a price on a greyhound that you think is going to start a quarter of those odds and go and give them the opportunity to close your account when it does start a quarter of those odds for a single bet. I just don't think I just don't think that's that's the way forward, Ian. I really, really don't. If you're going to lose your account, lose it for the right reasons, as you rightly said. I think that's good advice. Mark, before we go, um, and listen, we could probably do another another part of this, to be honest. I could talk to you probably for another three hours. I want to ask you a few quick ones. All right? Nice and short now. Nice and short. Okay. Uh, now, the, uh, best day. That doesn't necessarily mean punting. Just best day. Winning the Conan and Kirby with Roxanne Bully. Tw my wife tw bred that dog. Tw tw 2013. The first ever one. My wife, she whelped him. She reared him. And I need to get this bit out. I drove him over to Ross Lair in absolute chucking down rain and met uh, Damien Lonigan and told him he could be the best dog he's ever trained. And he looked at me with Owen McKenna eyes and said, another silly Englishman, you know? Yeah. But fair play to that team and fair play to the McKenna family, Owen and Sean and Damien. They got out of him what we knew was in him. And our best moment, forgetting we've had plenty in, was being able to witness the joy on there. Certainly... Owen and Sean's faces and the way we felt to be able to say that, crikey, you don't come to this side of the sea very often and do what we did. Now, we didn't train him, but we reared him and we were part of him and we owned him. Yeah, well, you, you clearly did enough to know that he was fast. He was very, very good. And we said he was very, very good. And Owen, you know, he, he confirmed that it was very, very good. And she, 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 not only did she win that, she, he elevated himself to be favourite for, for both derbies that year. And you know yourself, Ian, what happened to him in the semi-final of the ledger in, in Limerick. His career was short-lived. But we owe we owe, we owe owe a lot to that ground for giving us the inspiration, shall we say, to know that it can be achieved. Yeah. Yeah. He um, he was such a long, powerful, beautiful stride in greyhound, Absolutely. coloured greyhound. A coloured greyhound always looks better than a black greyhound or a brindle. And your father, your father, um, Ian, um, God bless him, I often play when I'm low because he just has a twang in his voice. He made a debut in in um, in Shelburne Park, and your father, the way he just said it when he glided around the second bend, it, your father gave him a name, and that name stays in our house. And I'm not just saying it because it's you, Ian. He called him the bully. He, he shouted out in his comment, the bully. And I was brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. I have to drag you down. Worst day. Roxon Bully getting injured. Uh, do you know? I, I wanted to think of something else because I thought you might. Um, I thought it might have sounded a bit of a cliche. Yet it was Ian. It, it just absolutely bust me up, bud. Bust. Let, let's move on, right? Uh, biggest single win. Single win. 
as in a single. Because we'll yes. get to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, I bet Rock's own girl 3,450 quid each way at 33 to win the St. Ledger. Oh, that's a nice one. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, biggest stacker? 108,000. Oh, sweet Lord. Uh, where? And that was, listen, that wasn't dogs. That was horses. That was horses. horses. Okay. And the last yeah. leg, the last leg, the last leg was um, on, on a night at Windsor on a Monday night where it was, the ground was desperate. The ground was desperate. And how you knew it was going to work for you, Ian, the favourite was drawn um, relatively high which meant he had to go over the far side on the soft ground with the others, and he didn't. He came down the middle, and we had two horses in the last leg that glued themselves to the far fence, and it was a three-way photo. The favourite was in the middle, and our two was over the far side, so we got two against one. And um, it went on and on and on and on, Ian. And I said, I'll take the three-way I'll take the three -way dead eat, you know? Anyway, it went our way. So, yeah, 108,000, yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, dream dinner. Uh, you and three others. Now, I'll tell you what I'll say. I'll say you and Haley and three others, because I'm sure Haley was going to be amongst the three. Okay. Um, my dream dinner. What, people with inside the sport? Inside the sport, outside the sport, dead, alive, doesn't matter. Myself and Haley. If I hadn't met Haley, I wanted to marry Kim Wilde. Oh, that's fair if enough. If Haley didn't marry me, she wanted to marry Roger Black. <laughs> the runner. You... The 400 meter runner. I'll, yeah, I'll let you choose the other. I don't know. <laughs> that, that is a random one. No, I can tell you. Uh, I don't know who we throw in there. M Mussolini. Right. Yeah. Uh, t TV series. You're probably not a big TV watcher. No. Uh, TV series. Um, I haven't got an answer in. Uh, yeah. TV series. Um, I don't know. So best, best advice received. Honestly, Ian, see all, hear all, and say... Yeah, from a punting point of view, I suppose that's the way it is. Uh, yeah. Best dog you've trained and best dog you've seen? The best dog we trained, I or, think... Or had, should I say. You know what I mean? It doesn't have yeah, to be... The, like, it I, could listen, be bully, shall we say, but... I couldn't... I, honestly, I could get... I, Hayley, I got Haley to write me a list down here because I was afraid we'd forget some of the all-time greats we'd ever trained, but I keep coming back to Rock's own girl, um, Ian, because what she was able to do from 200 yards to 1,000 yards... Yeah, she was pretty special, all right. Correct. But the one dog I will say that I think lulled his name in lights, shall we say, and wasn't able to fulfill his potential. Now, people might think I'm getting carried away here. I don't think I am. Because if I tell you what he came back from, Ian, and two two real vets that I've worked with for years said we're wasting our time, and for Hayley to achieve with him what she did with him after his injury, that never able was able to run in a derby, I think the niche fellow was a special little ground, Ian. A yeah, special little yeah. ground. If anybody breaks that, I'll make a statement. If anybody ever breaks that track record at Romford, then they can be the fifth person to come to dinner with me and Alien Roger Black. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, any hopes for the future? I hope I stay healthy. I hope my wife stays healthy. There's 10 years between us, and I don't want her to miss anything out of a bucket list that she wants to do, Ian. But if I honestly, honestly could have one wish outside of my family... I promised my granddad when he went to his grave that he always wanted to turn up on the Wednesday and have a bumper runner in Cheltenham. I will achieve that for him. Oh, I like in fact, that. I think Paul Hennessy might have one for me. There you are. Well, there you are. And I tell you what, that's a strong Greyhound connection if ever there was one. Yeah. Um, Listen, Mark, Like I could keep talking. I could keep asking. I'm looking at the clock there, 53 minutes. And, uh, I don't I'll want pay to... you all the time if you want to keep I, going. I'm enjoying I, I, this. I, listen, I'd go for another hour. Don't worry about it. We yeah. might have you back. You never know. Uh, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Just a few of the dogs you haven't mentioned, and we have to mention them. Uh, Rock's Home Hat, Rock's Home Magic, one of the truly great stayers of our time. Rock's Home Bully, Rock's Home Nage, Rock's Home Christoph, like Rock's Home Nage and Christoph and Bully. The three, you know, what could have been with those three greyhounds? Um, high but went so close to capturing a derby for you. What a great he was, yeah. And and through you know, sourced through one of your great pals, Greg O'Donnell. Honestly, listen, when that I, I, I was driving, I was driving in Ireland, it's quite ironic. And, and the phone went, and it was a guy called Paul Ramsey. Do you know Paul Ramsey? I know Paul, Paul very well, yeah. yeah. Paul rang me, and I was full of drinking, and it's the truth. And I could understand him very little. Honestly, this is true. This, as this story goes, Ian, it's the truth. Now, now and, to, to, put, to put it into perspective, Paul is from, from Derry, and it's very strong accent. Well, I couldn't understand him, and I did honest, didn't honestly know that some of the things he was saying to me, whether yes or no was the right answer. I didn't know. So we left it whereby I thought I'd said to him, 
yeah, I'll take a look at this dog in the morning and let you know. I thought I had. So I put the phone down. Hayley said, well, what's that? So I explained to her that Graham Holland had got a dog in the unraced stake in Clonmel that Greg and Paul Ellis were interested in buying and uh, would be interested in having it overseas and win a few races with it. da 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 She said, what? Are you sure that's that's where the conversation went? I said, yeah. So I told him I'd take a look at it. And she said, did you know that conversation was on loudspeaker then? On the on the car? I said, well, I thought I'd talk. I had the phone to me here and didn't realise I was talking in the car. <laughs> so I told him I'd take the Greyhound, which I thought I'd said I'd take a look at it. And the following morning, sure enough, he was on the phone to me and said that that deal's done. The dog will come over to you. And in fairness, and the rest is history. Um, I will say one thing, that if ever there was a night where I thought that we were going to achieve winning a derby, Ian, even before the dog went to the traps, and for a man that fully deserves it, in my opinion, Paul Ellis, wow, crikey, how, how, how close has he come? So, you know, oh, dear me. And when Hayley got that dog out the kennel that night, Ian, I left Hayley with the dog as she walked on the track and walked round to, to Paul Ellis who stood on the first bend, and he got him to win an insane amount of money, in an insane amount of money. And I put my arm around him. I said, you're going to win this derby, fella. You think so? He used to call me big man. I said, do you think so, big man? I said, no. I said, you're going to win this derby, big fella. Jesus, that's a big statement to make. And he went inside his coat pocket, in, And the lad he was with, I can't remember his name. He gave him 3,000 quid and went back to him again at eight to one. And I said, you'll be getting that back some. I mean this. And Greg and Trevor were there and Trevor said to me, Mark, you're supremely confident. I said, I've seen those six dogs come out the come out the kennels. And there's one dog that I can see is ready for this. And that's our fella. And the others better be ready. Because I can see our fella's ready. And Ian, I can remember Pat Curtin picking my missus up at the at the at the at the drop because the angle was so bad and thought he'd and there won. is and there is a big fella. <laughs> yeah, there is a big fella, yeah. So that was very close, Ian, I must be honest. Why why I got round to telling you that story is you asked me the worst night in ground racing. To think that you have, and to be told you haven't, Ian, in the hardest race to win in the world, in my opinion, that was tough to take as well. Still went out and party with Kevin Hennessy, though. I bet you did. I hate to finish on that note, but um, listen, Mark, it's been great. It's, we, we've seen a few insights. We, we've had a few stories. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Thanks for the chance. Well, that's it, folks, for Matchbook Meets. We'll be well back to you very soon. I, I'm not sure we're going to get quite as much colour as we did with Mark. Again, thanks to Mark Keatley, one of the truly great punters and indeed one of the great Greyhound men of the last 20 years or so. He's not quite gone out of the sport yet, have no doubt. He, he might have another one good enough to win a derby in the future. Perhaps not been trained by Hayley, but by someone. Well, that's it from us for Matchbook Meets. We'll see you next time.